welcome everybody to the show. Thanks for joining us once again on a Thursday morning. And we're going to be talking about real estate and all the usual things we do about uh, on the McCarroll team show. Uh, my name is Cam McCarroll. And uh, today I've got joining me, we've got Adam Cook. Howdy, gang. We have Tabitha Thompson. Howdy. We have Ara Hussein. Hey. And we have a special guest joining us today, the one and only Ryan Kish. Hi, everyone. Ryan is our uh, mortgage preferred mortgage broker on the McCarroll team. And uh, we're going to be doing a deep dive today into some uh, financing questions, talking about all the real estate changes uh, that have occurred due to the financing. Really, we have, we've been probably one of the most requested um, topics from our guests, uh, from our, sorry, from our uh, audience has been mortgage related items and how do we address financing concerns and, um, you know, what are some of the, you know, sort of the ins and outs of the financing world when it comes to investment properties. Uh, so we're going to be getting into that today. Uh, we're going to be doing a market dive uh, in the, the metro stuff, do some Toronto, do some, uh, we'll get into some Vancouver, Toronto information. And as always, we've got some live deals uh, to share with you all. And if you're new to the show, um, the live deal sections will be properties that are on the market or off the market, um, but are available for sale. And these will be properties that the team's got their eyes on. These are the best properties that they've seen on the marketplace. So they're bringing them to you live on the show. We're going to do it. We'll walk through the financials. We'll walk through the neighborhood. We will do a uh, synopsis of the whole opportunity and what the investment strategy is on each particular property. And these are available. So if you are interested in any of the properties we share today, you can reach out to us. We'll share our email and contact information shortly. Um, but the main thing is, is that there are, how many we got today, guys? We got two, or I know that, what do we got? Two? two. Yeah, looks like yep. we got two properties to share. So we'll do one at the front end, one at the back end. And just keep in mind that if the front one isn't up your alley from a strategy point of view, stay tuned for the last one because it might be completely different. Uh, we do all sorts of things on the team, working with buyers on the duplex conversions, multifamily properties um, from, you know, from any unit, really two units up to 30, 40 units. Um, and as well as helping with the renovation side of things, the burr strategy, all sorts of things we do. Uh, if you're new, if you're not new to the show, you'll know what we do, but if you are new, uh, you're in a really good place for, if you're a new investor, um, this is a great place to get acquainted with the process of investing. And it's also an interesting time in the market, if you will, um, considering we've come off quite a bit from pricing. So if you're thinking about doing some investing, if it's, you know, it's been, a, it's, it's probably good timing for you. You know, it's always good to do what other people um, are going to be doing rather than what everybody is doing. You know, back in February, everybody was hitting the real estate market and it was just driving prices up like insane. So now people are kind of starting to change a little bit out there. I mean, definitely it's softened. We was quiet ghost town for a while, but this month I can say, and I think you guys would agree on the show. Let me know. There has been a change in buyer uh, sentiment a little bit out there. There start, we're starting to see more buyers coming to the back uh, into the market, starting to recognize that there's been a drop in prices and that, you know, it's, it's really hard to time the bottom. And so while we may see a little more softening, it's hard to say when that bottom is going to be. So we're looking at 15% discounts across the board. Um, just generally speaking, some, some products a little lower, some products a little less, um, meaning like different price points are, are decreasing differently. 50%? But 15. Oh, I thought you said 50%. I was like... Whoa, buddy, that's a that's a big <laughs> drop. <laughs> yeah, I, I can have some outside of the box views sometimes, but certainly not under that realm. Yeah, I would hope. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, so let's dive into sort of the first things first. We're just going to get into like sort of the just sort of a little bit of housekeeping. If you're not on our buyers list, this is the best place to get uh, regular updates with uh, the properties that we share every week. So it's simple to join, go to mccarrollteam.com, get on the a buyer list there. It's the first slide you'll see on our website. Just put your name and your email in. And then every Friday morning, um, our marketing team will put together the properties that we have shared or that we got our eyes on this week. 
and we'll send it out to you and there'll be a link to all the financials, all the numbers, um, the video synopsis of the property, uh, where it is, what the strategy is. So if you're not on that list, check it out because it is uh, the place to get notified of what the top properties are. So um, I don't know what's going on with my slide there. I kind of lost a bunch of stuff, but that's empty. Uh, but the neighborhoods are definitely part of what we send out on uh, on Friday mornings. Uh, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, uh, check it out. We we update this regularly, uh, multiple videos a week, all about real estate, real estate investing, um, home buying in the Canadian and Southern Ontario market. And it would be most welcome if you'd head over there and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, we're trying to build our channel up so we can reach more people and educate more people. As you know, that's what we're all about here on the McCarroll team is providing value and just giving information about what's going on in the marketplace from an investor's point of view. All right. So why don't we just dive right in? Um, why don't we get into our first live deal? And who wants to present the first deal yeah. of the day? You got one, Tabitha? I'm on it. Excited yeah. to present this one. Um, so I'm going to present a duplex and the strategy for this one is a buy and hold opportunity. So it's a great opportunity for an investor um, to simply buy and hold for three to five years. So um, once you purchase, you would need to put a tenant in the upper unit because it's vacant. Um, and this main floor is tenanted currently, um, but that's great because you are going to be able to capture market rents. Rental rates are really high right now, and so you can secure uh, market rent. But looking at the location, actually here on the map too, um, we can see that you know the properties nestled right along the escarpment right here. So um, if you're not from Hamilton, uh, this road, Lawrence, runs right along the escarpment and all of the streets are, are really beautiful. They're, most are tree-lined. You see pride of ownership is evident throughout this neighborhood. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's an A neighborhood and it's south of Main Street, which makes quite a difference in tenant profiles. Um, so the demographics here are great. You'll have a good tenant in place and uh, probably secure a really high um, uh, rental rate. So um, we can take a look at some pictures. Unfortunately, there are no photos of the main unit, but there are pictures of the exterior and the upper unit. Um, it's in good condition and well-maintained. The property has two really large units and the, the pictures do, uh, I, I'd say are, you know, true to what it looks like in person as well. You know, sometimes you can't get a good feel of what a property looks at, looks like just from the photos, but um, you know, what you see is sort of what you get in this one. Both units are 900 square feet. So it, it's only a two story. It's not, it doesn't have an attic space. Um, but they're still really, it's, it's a really large unit and um, it's functional and shows well in person. Um, so each uh, self-contained unit consists of three beds and a den, one bathroom. And then, um, like I said, I only saw the upper unit as well, uh, but it has a really cute uh, patio space um, as well right here. Uh, well, it's actually pretty big. Um, and uh, so the main floor is, we, we can't see pictures, but it's tenanted right now for 1673, which is a bit under, um, you know, market rents. But if you have some turnover there, then the numbers will just look even better. Um, so I wish I had some more pictures to show you, but we can just get into the numbers here. Um, so for gross rents, you're looking at about 4,300. Uh, to break that down, like I said, the main floor is, uh, ha is getting 1,673. Um, I presume that you can uh, probably achieve about 2,500 for um, the upper unit, just a couple of variables there that I'd have to confirm, parking and things like that. Um, and then I put about 100 in because there is shared uh, coin laundry in the basement. Um, so that comes for a total of 4,300 per month. Um, if you were able to secure the property for 725, it's uh, been on the market for five days and it's listed for 750. Um, and so I've put in a purchase price of 725, assuming there's a little bit of negotiations there um, with 20% down at a 5% interest rate you would be cash flowing about $150. And I was able to include uh, vacancy 
and uh, repairs uh, and your expenses as well. I did not put property management. Typically I don't for only two units. Um, if you're out of town, you might want to include management as well. With management, uh, vacancy and repairs, all three in place, you're a little bit uh, cash flow um, negative. Um, but if, uh, you know, for one month you have no vacancy, don't need to fix anything, and you have no management in place, you're almost um, $450 cash flow positive. Um, so we would need some concrete numbers uh, to kind of look at the, you know, a better financial snapshot of the investment in our view, but based off of, um, you know, what I feel we can get the property for um, and, and those lease rates, I think it looks pretty good. So if you have interest um, with 24 hours notice, we can see that main floor. Um, so just reach out proactively and, and we can get you in there for a viewing. Right on. Any questions about anything you guys can post in the chat. If you have any interest, go to just, you can email sold at mccarrollteam.com. Uh, and just threw that in the chat there. Uh, any, any questions about anything at all or the properties that we share, that's where you got to go. And by the way, I forgot to introduce Matt who came on a little late there. Uh, Matt Grenier uh, from the McCarroll team is joining us as well. Welcome. Um, so yeah, we're going to dive Right. And so that's looking like an interesting deal. Um, we've got, so that's basically more or less a buy and hold, right? Like get in there, rent it out. There's no, it's not really a burr situation. I mean, there's potential for a burr. It, I think it could use a bit of a facelift cosmetically. So uh, there is potential for that as well. But I think that would make more sense if the main floor tenant uh, vacated as well at that point, then yeah, absolutely. But with that main floor tenant in place, I would say, um, buy and hold. Cool. All right. Good stuff. Buy and holds always welcome. Um, we often do some burr strategies and duplex conversions. So it's, it's kind of cool to see a buy and hold, just get in there and tenant it out and, and let, uh, let my, the market do its thing over the long run. Awesome. All right. Um, so I'm going to jump right into, uh, what I've got going on here, and then we're going to get into some mortgage stuff. Um, so we'll do a quick market update. Uh, so with Hamilton, uh, as every week, we always look at the kind of the, the, this is the cardiogram of the market. So how alive or how dead is the market? Where is it on the, on the life support system, if you will? Um, not life support system at all. We've got listings on uh, the rise for the week, sales on the decrease a little bit. So, you know, to be expected during August, that spread between the listings and the sales is is pretty is getting there. It's not quite as uh, you know as tight as it was during the last year, 2021. Um, when that sale number gets up to that green line, that's when prices are going to start to level off and start to increase uh, as they spread apart. They tend to decrease because we're basically talking about the supply and the demand in the marketplace right now. So this is the Hamilton market right now. We've been tracking this since really March of 2020. Um, but yeah, that's basic synopsis of what's going on there. I want to do a dive today into the uh, Toronto market, just a little bit of uh, a little bit of an update. Uh, is the Canadian real estate is not, as we all know, it's not really a uh, it's not a national thing. You know, it's very localized. Every market's different. But when we hear stats about the Canadian real estate market, what we're really talking about is Toronto and Vancouver, um, because those are the primary drivers. You know, those are where all the peeps are. Um, so it's worthwhile understanding what's happening in the Toronto market, even if we're focused in one geographic area. So in Toronto, we had sales down for the month of July, 7.3% uh, month over month. Seasonally adjusted, we're down 47% uh, year over year, you know. We know that, so that's, you know, not, nothing surprising there. We've seen that all over all the markets in Canada, um, but steep declines across all segments. It was the slowest July for home sales since 2002. Just gives you a sense of the buyer sentiment out there in July. Really, really, uh, it's a really, you know, dark and dismal for people. They're really, they're really a wait and see approach. You've seen declines in sales in every segment of, uh, in all areas of Toronto 416 and the condos and the detached, and the 905 detached, everything's down 40% in numbers of sales. If you look across historically, that's not that, it's, it's pretty low, you know, in terms of uh, monthly home sales. It's, it's the lowest it's been in, 
in it's uh well since 2002 as i said um but it's it's not terribly off so i mean we, we expect to see some rebounding in that uh, moving forward uh, in Vancouver, sales were off an estimated 8% month over month. Seasonally adjusted, we're down 43% compared to last year, including a 50% drop in single family sales. So a huge decrease in volume of sales. Sales <clears throat> volumes for July have not been this low since the 1990s. Uh, you can see how, how we're tracking in Vancouver over this year, the dotted black line well below every other year previously in terms of number of sales. And you know what? Not much of a surprise, really, considering um, the pace of rates and what we've been seeing in pricing. Toronto saw the largest monthly decline in house prices in July on record last month, while Vancouver, it was the largest since 2016. So you can see the Toronto um, house MLS house price index. This is sort of a you know softened version. If you look at the median prices, you're going to see a bigger decrease. But they're looking at monthly, uh, month over month changes of, uh, you know, 4%, you can see 3%. And then previous to that, it was like 1%, 1%. So we've been seeing month over month declines in pricing in Toronto. Um, we haven't seen these kind of numbers uh, ever. So it's, these are pretty substantial monthly declines. Okay. So these are month, month over month. So June to July, um, you know, and we'll, you know, previous month to month, Vancouver, we see little less decreasing happening there, um, but nonetheless, these are month over month declines. We've seen we've seen we've seen further price declines in the past, but we're we're seeing it across the board. Uh, the MLS house price index is still almost certainly understating the sharpness of the decline. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the median prices in Toronto have fallen about twenty two percent from the February highs versus down thirteen percent for the house price index. And the house price index is what policymakers uh, are going to be using uh, to make uh, decisions. So central banks and and government policymakers are going to look at the house price index. Oh, sorry, I'll get that back up there. Um, they'll look at the house price index to make their decisions. Um, whereas you know realtors and investors, we're kind of looking at uh, maybe median prices or average prices to sort of get a sense of where things are at. But keep in mind that pivoting in the interest rate environment from central banks. They're going to be looking at the house price index, which is showing a little lower um, declines. So the pain may be felt out there in the marketplace a little more greatly than, than the policymakers are aware of. So, you know, percent change in Toronto house prices in, from February to July, um, you know, in single families, you're looking at a median, um, median price decline of 25%. In Toronto, whereas the house price index is around that 15%, 13% mark. Uh, condos are down about 12% uh, median, the median price of condos, while the house price index is only showing about a 3% decline. Um, where in Vancouver, you've got a 12, 13% decline in the median and about a three or four, or yeah, about a 3% decline um, from peak. And condos are down about six uh, percent. I don't think we have a house price index for that. So it's interesting to see um, the divergence between those two. So we're going to be feeling it in the marketplace before policymakers start to really get wind of it. Keep that in mind. Um, rents have been on the on the tear all over, everywhere. Like, and Toronto is no different. Uh, we're way past pre-pandemic levels in the average monthly rent. And these are condos uh, rented through the MLS. It's a pretty accurate uh, way to track the numbers. Rents are a little difficult to track um, because some a lot of rentals are happening off of different sites like Facebook, GG. You know, not everything is listed on MLS, so the data is a little less accurate. But if you take the condo rented through MLS, you can see the average rent in a condo is about approaching twenty eight hundred dollars. So a little bit of respite from the declines in pricing people are seeing and uh, costs of mortgages, at least the rents are on the rise. And why does that happen? Because people are not being able to qualify where they were before they've given up on their home searches to purchase. So they are now in the rental market. So it's putting all sorts of pressure on the rental market. And we are certainly seeing that uh, locally as well. Uh, just jumping over real quick to an interesting marketplace in Canada is Calgary. Um, Calgary has actually seen some incredible sales considering it all, all things considered Calgary, um, Edmonton really on track to be almost one of, 
not all, pretty close to, you know, maybe third from the top of its strongest year in sales, like especially the beginning of the year. But if you take February forward, it's, it's this number of sales have been rip roaring. Most of that is within the condo market where condo purchasers, investors from Toronto, um, Toronto area have, they've, they've moved out to purchase in Calgary. A lot of them, um, not my recommendation. I don't like condos in Calgary personally, just due to the, um, the available land that's in Calgary. We talked about it before on the show, but there is not the same pressure in Calgary that we have in the Southern Ontario market where we have the, the green belt and the lake, um, compressing and the, you know, compressing the available housing supply, uh, Calgary has pretty wide open territory for building. So their single family market is, is they have a lot more available land to build. So the condos, I don't think you're going to see the same kind of pressure, but just from a financial point of view, people are out there buying, picking them up. Uh, so that's what we're seeing a lot of the purchasing happening is in the condo market out there. Calgary monthly home sales, um, are quite high, as you can see, um, historically speaking, things have been taking off out there. And what else do we have here? So the, and the series, the year over year price changes, Calgary and Edmonton are uh, still positive year over year. Um, and the only declines have been in Edmonton condos. So year over year prices are up in Calgary, Edmonton. Interesting, interesting to see. And um, these, these numbers, they don't include pre-construction, do they? Mm, these are resale. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're just resale. Um, okay, just jumping into some mortgage stuff. Um, the five-year deep discount mortgage mm -hmm. rates, fixed rates are come down a little bit um, from, from previous uh, weeks. Interesting to note that the bond market um, is down, like the bonds in Canada, the Canadian bonds are down where the fixed rates are tend to follow. I know in the U.S. that the, the fixed rates have come down quite a bit in the U.S. and the bond market has come down, the yields have come down in the U.S. and they, they've actually started to discount the mortgages in the U.S. Whereas in Canada, they've kind of kept their rates the same, even though the bond yields have come down. Um, I don't know. There's some reasoning behind that. And I, I, you know, some of the stuff that uh, my research pulls together is fixed rates have not pulled back nearly as much as the bond yields have at least not yet. Rob McLister, uh, who puts out an excellent newsletter, says that there's a lot of play right now, a lot at play right now. So much more than normal factors keeping fixed rates propped up in Canada include higher implied bank risk. So that's priced into the credit spreads, which impact a portion of bank funding. Banks must bake this into their pricing. Uh, a higher expected loan loss provisioning, which banks will have to start funding later in Q3, RBC predicts. That's a really important thing to watch when it comes to a measure of the economy is the loan loss provisionings in banks. So basically what that means is, um, you know, every quarter the banks put together their, um, how much, you know, default insurance they need to have on place, not insurance, but how much, how much of, how much money they need to have kind of stuffed away to cover some defaults. And when banks start increasing those loan loss provisions, it's an indicator that the banks have are, are tracking something that they see as a risk in the economy. Um, so they might anticipate higher, higher than average need for um, cash available to cover their loan losses. So it's a really important indicator uh, to, to keep an eye on. And those higher uh, loan loss provisions does bode uh, strongly for an increased chance of, you know, recession pathway moving forward. So the banks always, this is a kind of a leading indicator of recessionary uh, risks. Another thing that is causing banks to keep the rates where they're at, even though the bond yields have come down is a shifting preference for higher margins. Go figure. Uh, mm -hmm. Since when do banks want higher margins? Uh, rather than higher market share, in part to make up tight spreads earlier this year, as rates soared from mid-March to mid-June, Many lenders saw their five-year fixed margins shrink to almost nothing. So they're trying, uh, you know, another way of putting that is they're trying to make up money. Uh, less funding liquidity out there in the mortgage market uh, generally and a higher volatility driven hedging costs. Uh, so, you know, expecting things to go up and down a bit more. So they're trying to like just buffer the coffers. There's still plenty of downside of risk uh, sorry, there's still plenty of downside to fixed rates at these levels, and it wouldn't surprise 
uh, me to see them come in across the board 20 basis points or more lower over the next couple of weeks. So there's a, I don't know, I'll, we'll, we'll, try, we'll, we'll get to Ryan here. I can see his head nodding a little bit. Um, that, you know, there's is some anticipation to see fixed rates kind of come down a little bit over the next couple of weeks, Ryan? Yeah, you, you mentioned that there can as well in the US. Um, I don't pay a lot of attention to it, but I see the headlines and I saw um, a little bit of a decrease there, quarter points, so 25 basis points mm -hmm. uh, because of that, uh, that decrease in the bond yields. Canada saw that, but you're right, nothing has adjusted as of yet. So do I think it's going to come down? Yes, it could a little teeny bit, um, but I've looked back and probably the past 15 notifications we've gotten since March have all been increase, increase, increase. So as a matter of when, yeah, I think it could be soon, but it's just going to be a, such a small, uh, such a small number. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, any questions guys that you have, uh, you can chime in on the show, uh, just in the chat there, you can enter your, your questions there. We've got some, uh, uh, some questions for um, Ryan. I'm just going to pull up my questions here. Hold on a second. Um, two seconds. So yeah, any mortgage questions you got, this is your chance to get, speak direct with uh, an expert in investment real estate. Um, Ryan Kish, so he's going to be, you know, here's your chance. So don't be shy. If you've got some financing questions, uh, it's kind of like a call-in show. It sort of feels like, you know, CHML or something like that. Like, uh, oh, we've got, yeah. so anyway, I won't imitate that, but, uh, you know, chime in there with your uh, questions. If you want to be unmuted or something like that, put your hand up and we can even go that route. What the heck? Let's live risky uh, and see if we can get some technological uh, things happening here. So as far as questions go, I'll lead it off a little bit. Um, so basically, we're like, what are current interest rates, Ryan, for for investors and home buyers sure. today? Like, what are we looking at? You know, if we're running our numbers on investment properties, what's what's your what's your recommendation? So what you know, what are we doing? Sure. So going back to that model there that Tabitha had, she had counted in there a five percent interest rate, which mm -hmm. may be a little tiny bit high right now. However, the next announcement is going to be September seventh, and I see that question in our in our box. There's an interest rate hike likely this September. And the answer is, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 60, 70% chance. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess I know I don't like to make the predictions, but I do feel like we could see a little more increase on that, uh, on that prime, which would bring interest rates up a little bit. Um, and then the general consensus is, Hey, they're going to kind of taper off and, and slow down after there. So I, I do think that is going to be possible in terms of where rates are today. Big answer is it depends, okay? Depends on the borrower, the property, the down payment, all that sort of stuff. But generally speaking for an investor, right now variable sitting at around the 4.5 mark. That's kind of where I like to, to use for, uh, for my projections. And then fixed, like you said, are all pretty much over five. Um, we haven't done too many fixed rate mortgages, probably 80% are, are variable. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of fixed coming in that five, three, five, four, um, kind of level. And these are investments you're talking about when you say yeah, these are investments, 5.5, 5.4 in and around there for a fixed and mm -hmm. then variable, maybe like the 4.5, 4.6 kind of mark. Um, okay. again, depending on the lender, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then residential, uh, what's like if home buyers looking at, you know, is it, what's the rule of, th is there a rule of thumb you follow or what, how do so you, in terms of for qualifications in terms of just interest rate? Just, uh, just kind of kind of going interest rate for a for a home buyer right now. Sure. Like, oh, I'm gonna go buy home. What am I running my numbers at? Yeah, I mean, rental properties they tend to carry a 15, 20 basis point premium. Okay, depending on the lender, depending on the product. Um, so, so, for those who don't know what a basis point means, when you say 15 to 20 basis points, we're talking about 0.15 to 0.2 percent. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. 0.25 quarter quarter point, 25 basis point. So. Um, generally speaking, kind of in that maybe a four, three, four, four on an owner occupied, and then a four, five, four, six kind of on a, uh, on a rental property, um, fixed rates again, yeah, still about a point higher. So even if those, those variables do move up, they would still have to go up at least a full percentage point mm -hmm. just to catch up to the fix. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty rare to have the variable above the fixed. It has happened. I think maybe back in 2018 or something like that. I think it, it just, 
the, at least the overnight, at least the overnight rate, it just peaked up for a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other big thing too, you have to be conscious with is, is the penalties. Okay. Remember that almost all variable rate mortgages are three month interest penalty to get out of. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which might work out to say $3,000. The fixed rate mortgage, that's calculated a little bit different. So you've got your current interest rate versus where interest rates are today times how many years you have left on the term. So a $500,000 mortgage on a, on a variable, which might cost you $3,000, could be $15,000, $20,000 to break as a mm -hmm. fixed rate, right? So you yeah. have to some of the fine print, some of the other things. So we like to see, hey, is this a buy and hold? How long are you planning on holding? Are you gonna do any refinances? Are you gonna make any changes? Those are all super, super important um, factors to consideration. Absolutely. Yeah, every situation is different, right? And I think yeah. you're, that's your your ball game when you're when you're consulting with somebody is okay. Well, what are you thinking of doing? Are you thinking of refinancing in the future? Are you going to do renovations like fixed rate or variable? Which is the one to go with? I think from a numeric point of view, like from a cost savings point of view, I I think variable is the way to go. Personally, I'm just you know this is not financial advice, of course, but just personal anecdote. Variable. We've been a big believer in it. Yeah, we've yeah. been a big believer in it. Um, full disclosure, all mortgage agents, mortgage brokers get paid the exact same. So there's no incentive right. to put someone into a fixed product versus a variable. It's mm -hmm. simply one box that we check off. So we kind of give the pros and cons to both and then make a decision. But I'm going to say that over the past even year, uh, over 80% have been into, into variable. Totally. Yeah. Even after these recent hikes, I mean, I bet you that number is still 75% higher. Yeah, that definitely is what we're, what the market is, uh, like the data is telling us. Mm -hmm. um, so how are new rates affecting investors and home buyers right now? Like, you know, the higher rate plus the stress test, you got higher purchase, sorry, less purchasing power. Um, so what are you, what are you seeing out there? Like, are people having to kind of shelve their investment plans? you know, or, and go with, or, or home buying plans. And are you seeing that like, Oh, sorry, these rates are just putting you out. You're not, you're not able to move forward. So I don't know if you can give some examples or. Sure. sure. So you're seeing. two things with that is um, number one is, yeah, the big, the big buzzword in the media is the whole stress test. Now, yeah. again, going back to that line of everybody's different, a person who's buying say their first home or their first rental property really isn't going to affect them too, too much. Okay, that extra 1% in an in increase in rates may bring down your capacity, your purchase price by about four or 5%. Okay, which so, is- So just, just to be clear about the stress test, let's mm -hmm. maybe explain what that is for those who, who are unaware, because sure. we, we've got some new people on the show for sure that yeah, haven't- absolutely. absolutely. So how that works is the bank, when they qualify you, they qualify you regardless of where your mortgage rate is. I remember seeing some stuff, 199 fixed, you know, a couple of years ago, year and a half ago. They're going to qualify you at 5.25%. So they're going to say, hey, Cam, you're going to get this new mortgage. We know the rate is 199 or 299 or anything, but we want to prove you want, sorry, we want you to prove to us that you can qualify as if that rate was at 5.25. Right. So it's either 5.2, the greater of 5.25 or your actual rate plus 2%. Okay. Right. So Going back to that, before we were calling everybody, say at five two five, now we're having to qualify them at maybe six two five or six and a half. That extra percent is working out to be about four percent, five percent of the total purchasing price. So now, the reason it's at six point five is because it's two percent above um, the current mortgage rate that they're qualifying at, right? So the current mortgage rate being four point five, roughly speaking. Depend, you know, depends on what you're depending on the rate, but you're adding two percent to that, so that they are qualifying now at six point five. So that extra one percent above the one and a quarter percent or whatever it is above the, the stress five. test, yeah, the stress test rate is is only equaling a four percent, um, a four percent uh, what reduction in your purchasing power essentially. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which isn't a heck of a lot, is it? It's yeah, like it's on a million exactly. on a million bucks, you're talking forty thousand dollars less of a purchasing power. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, going back to that as well is yes, rates are up, but housing prices have come down, right? With these with these decreases. So you may be paying another four or five hundred dollars a month as an example on your mortgage, but you've got a property for maybe a hundred thousand dollars less in mm -hmm. purchase price. Um, 
I don't think there's been a better time. You know, um, you got to look at this long term. You really got to think of the of the long play. And to get into something that's 400 bucks more a month, say 12, 12 months is about $4,800, $5,000. Over that five-year term might be 25 extra grand in, in costs, which a lot yeah. of them are, are deductions anyways, write-offs anyways. But if you're getting a property for 100,000 or 150,000 less, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Those numbers, those numbers just don't lie, right? Yeah, I love that. I love that case, uh, that that example, that thought process of okay, I'm, you're 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 it rates are up, prices are down, uh, you're getting discounted versus February highs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're paying four hundred dollars maybe more a month, but you're getting a hundred fifty thousand dollar discount on that. So it's going to cost maybe twenty five thousand in interest costs over the five year period. Uh, extra, but you're getting what's better? Pay twenty five thousand uh, dollars, and, and get a hundred fifty thousand dollar discount, or or just like not get in the market, right? Not like, get any discount or not do anything. Yeah, no. Exactly. Yeah, I see your point. That's awesome. Yeah. Top of the your question. Test can can affect um, where it can really make an impact is when I talk to a lot of people that have multiple properties. Right. So I'm working with a gentleman right now. He's got four. And they, though, those all happen to be variable rate mortgages. So what's happened is those four or five mortgages that he has, and he's got an owner occupied and then four rentals, so five total, they've all gone up four or $500 per month, which is then affecting for his fifth or sixth purchase, right? Because those have all gone up. So the, the impact, I'm not saying it's quite as five times because the five properties, but it's affecting that individual versus someone who's buying maybe their first or maybe second rental property. So you're talking about debt coverage, like the, the ability to pro handle $400 across five property, four yeah. more, sorry, $400 times four or five, that's going to reduce the amount you can qualify for potentially on sure. your fifth property. An extra $2,000 in payments there, the next property might only be $2,000, right? So those are looked yeah. at the exact same. So it is impacting people's ability to, yeah, to, to move forward for sure. Absolutely it is. Mm -hmm. Tabitha, do you, have, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I was just going to ask, is the stress test, can you confirm if it's in play um, for a variable and fixed uh, yes. mortgage? It is for both, right? Yeah, okay. The stress test works out to be the greater of 5.25% or your rate plus two. So almost everyone is basically their rate plus two now because even the lowest variable rate mortgages on the market, when you add that, that 2%, that brings you up and above that 5.25. Yeah, it's like the 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 policymakers said, all right, you know, back when rates, I don't know, when did the stress test come in? I forgot. I think it was like 20, 2018 or 2017, 2018. Yeah, right around the, the frothy period of 2017, they were like, okay, let's make sure in this in a low interest rate environment that you know people aren't getting locked in to a mortgage that they can't afford and you know when the rates go up, like today. Right. Sure. Like it was actually a pretty cool policy, I think, from a from a, you know, let's not let the market fall apart on a situation. So what mm -hmm. they did was they said, all right, everybody's got to qualify at five and a quarter or two percent above whatever they get, whichever's higher. And the reason they did that was like make, you know, take care of people. Right. Like, you know, mm -hmm. the whole let's make sure everybody's not in trouble sort of deal when the rate, rates go up. And that's what we're dealing with today. So in, in, a, in an essence, it's been a good policy. Would you, I mean, to prepare people for what we're dealing with today, would you agree? It's almost always been around too for variable, even prior to stress test. Mm -hmm. They would look at that variable and say, I think at the time might've been four, five, nine or four, seven, nine in the event that it did increase. So four or five years ago, you would actually qualify for a way bigger mortgage on fixed because that mm -hmm. stress test wasn't around. So we right. just qualify you at the rate say, you know, 299, 279, right? Yeah. Now, with that in place, you actually qualify for a higher loan amount on a variable rate today as you do as a fixed rate. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, question from Muhammad. Is it the right time to invest or wait a little bit? Funding is not an issue. All right. Well, nice place to be in. Funding's not an issue. Kudos to you. So you're sitting there on the sidelines, Muhammad, wondering 
is this the right time to invest or should I wait a little bit? I guess the question is on everybody's mind is like, why would you wait? The waiting is due to probably thinking that the market's going to go down some more. And why would you buy now if you can get a discount on the property in two, three months because prices will be declining. I'm assuming that's what your the, the counter argument is. Who wants to who wants to handle that one? Anyone? I'll, I'll jump in quick on a, on a financial financing kind of thing. Um, okay. You know, going back that old rule, time in the market is better than timing the market okay so the longer you're kind of in as opposed to picking and choosing when to jump in and out kind of like the stock market um so yeah is it a, is it a right time now it's definitely better now than it was back in february that's for sure anyone want to chime in on that who wants yeah to i know we talk about all the time um you know doing what other people you said it at the beginning of the show you know you want to do what other people aren't doing you want to you know and i know that there's always the sense that maybe it'll go down some more maybe if i wait and and you know it's it turned pretty darn quickly uh you know it turned within about a month really from like a crazy seller's market to to dropping and you know no one's got a crystal ball but if you're not out there looking if you're not active if you're not ready to take action now i i know we all agree i think it's a great time to be looking you know, there's less competition. There's a lot of listings on the market. You know, why sit on your hands now? Why not be active and at least be looking for the deals that, that make sense for you? Yeah, I just want to qualify it. You know, the the saying was, do what others are will be doing in the future. Um, so just, yeah, like people are kind of on the sidelines. Some are on the sidelines. People are coming back to the table more now and in investing. But are they going to be buying again in the future? Of course there will be buying again in the future. Um, and so it's at, you know, everybody wants to get into the market when everybody else is doing it. And that's like the worst time to do it. You know, like back in February, or January, everyone was dying to get in. And, you know, that now it's, it's a very, very different market. So you're able to get discounts. You're able to get um, motivated sellers who must get rid of, they got to get rid of the property. There's a little more, there's a lot more negotiating room available in some cases. Uh, I've picked up the best deals in my life in August, um, August of past. And we're in a really, you know, this is a very quiet time of the year, generally speaking, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. how it's going to go, nobody knows for certain. Um, I think again, if the deal makes sense, I don't know if, you know, if the deal makes sense now, um, you know, and it, if it de- goes down 5%, 10% in the next three, to six months over five year period of time, if your deal makes sense, if you're, if you're buying for the right reasons, um, you know, that five-year window is what you should be thinking about five years, 10 years. Don't be thinking about necessarily the next three to six months only, right? Factor it in, of course, make it part of your decision-making process, but timing the bottom is, is a very, very difficult thing to do. Yeah. I was going to add to that, Cam, um, very difficult to do. And like the, the way the psychology works, cause I had a client that was in a similar situation. He's like, okay, like, seems like the prices are going down. This is like during COVID, right? Uh, and he was like, okay, we'll wait till the prices go down a little bit more. And then we'll buy, right? Like, and it's like, and it's going down. And it's like, okay, we'll wait a little bit longer. Because when it's yeah. on the down, you're like, well, okay, it's going to go down more and more and more. And then when it hits the bottom, you don't really know that's the bottom. And then it starts going back up. And you're like, oh, no, shit. Like, it's going back up. I don't want to buy now. Like, maybe it's going to come down again, right? So it's like mm-hmm. that mentality of uh, you're going to wait until it hits the bottom. Unfortunately, we don't know when the bottom is. It could be tomorrow, tomorrow yesterday. Like, for all we know, the bottom's already happened, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just, every- we don't know that. So if the property makes sense, um, like you said, like if it makes sense, today it will make sense tomorrow or vice versa like if it made sense tomorrow it should make sense today it's not necessarily you know the market what the market is doing it's the specific property if that makes sense for you for what you're looking to do and the numbers work then timing it doesn't really matter yeah. when I, Question. I, don't when know. I go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> when i circle back to you know my own clients and investors who bought three four or five months ago and are very aware that the market's come down since then. When I ask them how they're feeling about their investment, um, you know, the response is, well, this is long-term. This mm-hmm. is a long-term investment. So I'm not following the short-term shifts in the market right now. And right now, you know, my, my rents are high and I got good tenants in place or I'm airbnb this unit and I'm doing great. And um, we quickly move, move past that, that question. And they're, they're still happy, even though they've you know, when, when we talk about it today, it seems like they paid a lot more for what they could have got that same property for today. Yeah. Time, time erases all, what is this saying? Time, time heals all wounds, right? 
Adam hit the nail on the head there too, as well with, um, you know, saying no one's got a crystal ball with it. So no one knows when the bottom is, but I'll tell you now, I think is a much easier, and, and again, this is more of a real estate thing than a, than a financing question, but now I'm finding people are having a lot easier times. There's no more of this, Hey, we're listing on Monday, bring us your best offer on Sunday night at seven o'clock. You know, I'm seeing more conditional offers. I'm seeing people to do more due diligence, not have to go in and, and, and bid with 10 or 15 other buyers. So I truly do think now is a, is a better time. Absolutely. Yeah. And it just anecdotally feels like we're, we're kind of, you know, the prices aren't dropping the way they were. And like you said, it's sleepy in, in August, but it just kind of anecdotally feels like we're just, we're getting to that bottom. But I feel like the market moved a little bit better in August, those last couple of weeks there in July and in, kind of coincides with that chart. Um, you know, the Bank of Canada made that interest rate announcement on July 14th. And then everyone just kind of went into silence for those uh, vacations. Uh, couple weeks. Yeah, vacation mode. COVID was dying off. People were traveling, new border restrictions. And then everyone just kind of was on this wait and see approach. And then right after the August long weekend, I felt just things moving. People were more realistic. It just felt like it was it was just moving and, and sinking and the news was already there, right? Um, right. Just moved a little bit back. Yeah, we had a question uh, from Anonymous. Um, they're on the show today. Um, what are the what are the going interest rates for a second mortgage on loan to value greater than 90%? Ooh, greater than 90%. Wow. Not too many is, people. Is, it, is that even doable? Yeah, in this in this market, I'm going to say no. And even in a even in previous markets, 90% was tough. Um, a lot of people kind of capped out at 80, and still to this day, 80, 75%. But a ballpark rule on a second, they start at about 10% for a second mortgage, private second mortgage. You're roughly 10% interest rate. Yeah, 10, 11%. I was going to say, if you're going to try to get more than 90% LTV right now, you might have to give them a kidney or something. Yeah. <laughs> you well, I do have a question for you. Um, and it actually dovetails nicely into our uh, buyer tour that's going on this Saturday. Yes. Um, so first time home buyer, maybe they can afford a 500K mortgage. If they're looking at moving into a duplex, will a lender look at that potential rent that they will get on a legal unit and will that help them afford a higher mortgage? That's a, that's a great question. So the answer is yes. However, it doesn't make as big of an impact as people say, or people think in terms of qualifying. What it certainly does is make a different impact on their financial position or their bank account or wallet, whatever you want to, whatever you want to say. So as an example, real quick, let's say that borrower makes a hundred thousand dollars per year and is buying a house for 500,000. Now, maybe that particular house has an in-law suite or, or a second self-contained unit in there that may rent for say $1,500 as an example. Now, that would be $1,500 towards that person's overall costs, property taxes, mortgage, insurance, what have you, let's say $3,000 a month. That's gonna cut that number in half by them. Or, or sorry, that's gonna cut that number in half for them. Okay, because of that $1,500 monthly rental income. However, in terms of how the banks look at it, what they do is, again, depending on the lender, they're going to add anywhere from 50 to 100% of that monthly rental income to the person's income. So essentially, let's say, let's say we did something like 70%. Okay. Um, that would add about roughly $13,000, $14,000 to their $100,000. So you might have an increase in purchasing power by about 13%. Yeah. So five so, might turn into 565, maybe 600. If someone was approved for 500, mm -hmm. now they have that secondary suite or rental income, we might be able to get that closer to $600,000. So you might get an extra hundred grand on the mortgage. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't blow it, it out doesn't of the water. Blow it like everybody thinks like it, it, it really impacts your day to day and your monthly payments that you're making. So the, there's a good thing there, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a ton more money for the bank. So adding like $15,000 to your income isn't, uh, isn't, isn't going to change a whole lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. It really, uh, yeah. But on certain deals that can help make or break it. Or if someone's 
you know, at that 450, 500 level, and we need to get them up 50, $60,000, that can certainly help. Okay. Absolutely. That's what, that's with an active tenant in place. Correct. Correct. A lot of banks too are taking what's called market rent reports. Okay. They actually prefer them because of all the fraud that's happening with, with people just scribbling down, Hey, I'm renting here for 2000, 3000, whatever this, when the appraiser comes to appraise the house, they'll do what's called the schedule a market rent report. And they'll actually look at what houses and properties and units are renting in that area and kind of get those figures. And oftentimes those are coming in quite high. And if the person doesn't have a tenant in place or an active lease in place, we can opt to that method to, uh, to kind of speed that up, fast track that. You don't cool. necessarily need to have it rented out. Pardon me? You don't necessarily need to have it rented out. Have, have to rent, rent it out, correct. Just, yeah. it has to have the potential for that rental. Income. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I'd say over 50% of the rentals that we do aren't rented out and we're relying on that market rent report, which is, which is fantastic. Very simple, very easy to do. All right, cool. Um, yeah, this weekend we have a buyer tour happening. Uh, this is going to be for, it's really a residential home buyer tour. So if you're thinking about making a purchase, you know, you're getting into the market or you want to go. So Ryan's going to be joining us uh, and we're going to be looking at um, how many properties we think I'm looking at, uh, Tabitha? I believe two. We're going to look at two. We're going to go look at a couple of properties. We're going to talk about the, the process. You know, we're talking about numbers on them each, uh, each property. And so it's a great opportunity to see what it looks like, um, you know, to make a purchase. Anything you want to add to that, Tabitha? I mean, I just think it's going to be very personal. Whoever is coming, we just really want to cater to what you're looking to get out of the session. Um, and, you know, while we're standing there, just come prepared with your questions. And there'll be me, another agent, and Ryan as well, a mortgage broker, um, mm -hmm. to get all your questions answered. Because sometimes that's all it is, is getting the conversation started in mm -hmm. order to, to take action. So, Yeah, and you can join that link. Uh, the, you can join by going to the link that was just put in the chat there, uh, the Eventbrite link, and we'll get you there. It's absolutely free. Uh, that's our property tour. Check it out. Um, one other question there, I just think, I think we might've addressed it from Mike is the extra 2% qualifier on fixed or variable rates. And that's on the variable, right? Ryan, for the stress test, I believe he's referring to. Yes. So, so either five, the greater of 5.25% or your interest rate, whatever it is, plus two. Okay. So whatever okay. number is higher, that's where they're going to stress test you on. Yeah. So if you have a 5.25%. I have one here, 5.24% fixed. Um, we're going to test you at 7.24. So we're going to say, hey, if, you're, if your rate was 7.24, do you still qualify for this property? Yes, it's approved. Right? That's that whether it's a variable or, uh, or fixed. I'm, I'm sorry, Aaron? Whether it's a variable or a fixed, you're still doing the... You're, you're still qualifying at your rate plus two. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, cool. Um, Almost all of it is over is over 5.25. Now there's not too many. I don't think there's any products that are at 3.25%. No, not even in the insured space with, with five or 10% down, which tends to get you a little bit of a better interest rate. There's nothing under that right now. Right. So, yeah, so everything, everything's over plus two. Yeah. Right, right, right. And not until rates come down, will that change? Exactly. Right, right. Okay, cool. Um, Will someone who can afford, um, uh, no, I think we addressed that one. Hold on, sorry. Um, how is income from an income generating property with tenants in place looked at by lenders when qualifying a buyer? So how is income from an income generating property with tenants in place? How are, how are lenders looking at that when they're qualifying a buyer? Like, does it, how does it help qual? How does it help the buyer qualify? Mm. Like we kind of talked about this with like a person, an owner occupied situation with an in-law suite. Um, I don't know. Do, do you want something along those lines? Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Ryan? Does that sure. make sense? So again, every lender is different and every situation is different, but a lot of lenders that we work with on the super clean, you know, straightforward files, we're talking like the Scotias, the TD, stuff like that. What they'll allow us to do is they'll allow us to use 100% of the rental income on that property to help qualify the deal. So person has maybe their own home or they're renting or, or what have you. 
and they're gonna purchase a rental property. They're gonna need 20% down, which is required for the rental. They're gonna to need to pass that stress test. And then the nice part is they're gonna look at the rental income that that property brings in. If we take a look at Tabitha's property there, I think it was 42 or 4,300 there, 25 and 17, that's 4,200. We take 4,200 and times it by 12, 4,200 times 12. And that brings 50, you to 50,400. So now I'm gonna be able to use the person's salary, which is 100, plus their rental income of another $50,000. So their buying power, just because of the rental component of it, went up by almost 50% because of that rental income. Now, a common misconception is that, hey, the property's renting for say $3,000 a month, both units, $4,000 a month for both units, and your mortgage and taxes are lower than that and you're cash flowing, therefore it should work. It doesn't quite work that way, right? How the bank underwrites it. If that was the case, then basically you could buy unlimited properties because right now and pretty much any time, no one's going to really buy a property that doesn't, you know, break even or, or kind of cash flow a couple hundred dollars, right? So essentially that rental income gets added to your income. In that example, it gives you 50% more um, purchasing power and the ratios are calculated off of that. So it helps huge immensely. Mm -hmm. And how so, does, it, does it matter? Sorry, Ara, um, real quick. Does it matter how many properties you own, or or how does how does does that just continue on? You know, yeah, that, property that one, two, three, four. On with your other with your non-subject properties. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was going to ask. So when they're doing their calculation, um, the debt service ratios, are they factoring in the mortgage payment for that property and the property tax and insurance? Property tax heat and the mortgage payment that's all they're they're looking at there yeah gotcha so that'll get added to your expenses just like how the income is getting added to your gross net up gross correct net correct in order for it to have no real impact okay like we, we call these like a, a non-change property general rule of thumb is about double what the rent and taxes are so if you were renting a property out for say $5,000 a month, which I'm seeing on a lot of duplexes and certainly certainly triplexes, right? If your mortgage and taxes and, and, uh, and heat costs, okay, were $2,500 and you're renting for five, they would almost have no impact on your ratios. So if you could find say 10 properties right now and assuming you have the down payment for them that we're all renting for, for double the mortgage and taxes, you could qualify those with with no problem yeah okay and they are out there it's rare but they are out there they are out there yeah okay we got a question um from marcel how can a how can a retired person buy a rental property best thing to do marcel is to pick up the phone call me call your bank call a mortgage broker it's a free call um and see exactly what your situation is um, a lot of government retirees that have strong pensions, they'd be surprised you can qualify for stuff. So a big part of that's going to be is what kind of income you're, you're claiming or, or, or earning. And then as well, what kind of financial resources you have behind you in terms of down payment investments, but absolutely pick up the phone and call and, you know, we can certainly see cause everyone's situation is different. Right. Um, yeah, retired with some income would probably be required. I'm guessing you, sure. if you didn't have any income, you're you're going. It'd be real. Tough to do. Yeah, unless you have a stock net worth, a big stock portfolio, something like that, it right. could be difficult to do for sure. Yeah. Cool. If you're relying on just CPP and OAS and not and not really have any other pension or kind of monthly income, it could be very very difficult for sure. Okay. Um. The question from Muhammad, uh, could you possibly share the details of the property for Saturday tour? I'm working, won't be able to run. Yeah, absolutely. They are just up there in the chat. Um, the eventbrite.com uh, link there will take you to the uh, property tour on Saturday. Muhammad, welcome to join us. Uh, Rachel, how is the rental market in Hamilton? It's tighter. It's getting tighter and tighter and hotter and hotter. And the rates we're getting for especially clean units are getting excessively higher <laughs> like we're seeing numbers you know like three bedroom rentals at 
um, you know, 20, 25, 26, 2700 for three bedroom units in, in like duplexes. Now these are nice units. Um, I've seen, I've seen higher in, in three bedrooms in some cases it's, 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 you know, the market is, there's a lot more supply, um, than say, uh, you know, maybe what we have going on in the condo market in Toronto in terms of rentals. Um, there's a little a meaning, sorry, not supply, but a little more vacancy. That's what I meant to say. Um, there's a little higher vacancy, but we're still seeing the quality units having increased pressure on those numbers upwards. So um, I would, I would, anyone want to add to that? I would qualify the rental market as um, very decent in Hamilton. Very if I can, if I could uh, add into that, um, just leased out an attic unit uh, this week. So it was listed $150 higher than it was rented out for last year. Uh, it was listed for two weeks. We had 175 inquiries <laughs> and 15 <laughs> applications to lease. And now it's leased. So uh, it was posted, you know, two weeks before the end of July and it was available for August 15th. And a <laughs> lot of tenants moved up their dates to be able to accommodate the uh, landlord's date for possession. So right. it was, uh, yeah. People started yeah. jumping through hoops pretty quickly just to get their applications in. Yeah, we should really do a rental market update, maybe get our leasing manager. Uh, we have a leasing department on the team and we can have you know our leasing department, leasing manager come out and talk about what they're seeing. And, you know, but we're hearing this all the time from our investor clients and from our rental market and from the property management companies that sister company, Platinum Property Management. If you have any property management needs, don't hesitate to give us a call. Um, but yeah, the definitely seen some strength in the rental market it's it's a landlord market too Every, that's what everyone's saying um you can pick a quality tenant like i mean look at the numbers that matt listed off there if that tenant isn't perfect out of 175 inquiries and 15 applications i mean it doesn't it doesn't get any better than that right so yeah you can pick who you want you don't have to take the first person that calls and you can really get a qualified tenant review their background check their job history look at their income and know that there's not going to be any problem with with uh, with payment of rent. Yeah, yeah. I would say some of the things I've noticed is, um, you know, first, I mean, your rental unit has to be pretty decent, right? If not fully renovated or something like that. Um, but then there are things like, you know, location, parking. Uh, if it has a dishwasher or in suite laundry, things like that do impact the probability of how quickly you can rent it out and for how much. So stuff like that you can pay attention to as well. For sure. Uh, any other questions, guys? We're gonna we're gonna wrap it up pretty soon here. Um, I'll so I'll, I'll give I'll have one more question for you, Ryan, and then see if anyone else has a last minute question, uh, and then we'll be wrapping it up. Uh, my question: uh, What are the current lender options for 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 investors? Meaning, like, how are they different across different lenders? So, like, perhaps like a Scotia Bank versus like an Equitable Trust or something like that, or. Yeah, you know, what from an investor point of view, what are the different options like? And what do you like? Why would you go with, you know, um, a B lender or you know, what's you know, can you talk a bit about that? Like, you know, some some people are like, oh, I only want to go with like a Scotia Bank or a Royal Bank, and I don't even ever want to, you know, why why would somebody um, you know, how do you how do you choose a lender like from an investor point of view? Are there some preferred lenders, you know? Sure. There? So they're really breaking that broken down into three categories. We'll call them basically A, B, and a lenders being your Scotias, your TDs, your First Nationals, um, the class. best rate. Okay, that's what it, that's what it comes down to. Um, more so important than the rate is the terms and conditions, how much rental income offset we could use. So, as an example, when we're qualifying a deal, maybe the one lender is say at four point two percent, but they're only allowing us to use fifty percent of the rents. Well, mm -hmm. another lender might be four point three or four point four percent, but they're going to allow us to use hundred percent of the rents. So for an extra $30, $40 in a month is irrelevant if that's what it takes to qualify the deal, okay, on the, on the A side. Now, misconception, I think it's the media or just online what people are reading that they're saying, hey, if I can't get into an A lender, I want to get into a B lender. These are the equitable banks, home trust, um, First National Excalibur, all sorts of stuff. These, generally speaking, guys, are for, for two big reasons. Number one is bad credit. Okay. And number two is if you're self-employed, okay. And non-income qualified. Okay. Those are reality of the two big reasons for B lenders. 
chances are for a salaried employee, let's say, who, who has their T4s and their pay stubs, they work here, this is how much they make. If you're not fitting into the A channel, okay, the A lender, then I highly doubt you're going to fit into the, into the B spot because mm. just about the same amount of qualifications go into them. They have higher rates, which allows for a higher, or sorry, which, which triggers a higher stress test to qualify for. Okay. And if you're not fitting in, if you can't qualify in that stress test and with those rates there, then how are you going to do it with, with a B lender? Like I said, bad credit, B lender. Self-employed and you've got a business with cash flow. Okay, you're a commission salesperson, and maybe you make two hundred thousand dollars a year in commissions, but you write it down to eighty. We have lenders that will allow us to use go off of your gross. Okay, so now you can qualify in that fee space by maybe your taxes are showing eighty, your line one fifty runaway away is eighty, but meanwhile you're grossing two hundred. We could use maybe one fifty, one sixty in income now. On the A side, it's what's recorded, and that's it. On the B What's side. recorded on your, your notice of assessment. Exactly. On the B yeah. side, we'll go over your gross. So a real estate agent, we'll look at your T4A and we'll use that and that will help qualify for the B. And okay. then the final thing obviously is C, which is private, which has its, has its places for everybody. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of them, last minute ones for people that haven't sold in time, um, didn't get as much money they wanted for the property, all sorts of that stuff, but that's kind of my last, my last resort, right? To go there. Rescue um, packages. Yeah. Kind of rescue package or, you know, it might be suitable for something that's an in and out or for mm -hmm. a property that's in total disrepair, like no kitchen. It's kind of gutted. No banks yep. on that anyways. So you have to go, you have to go private. And yeah, again, we use pri sorry, sorry. We use privates all the time on the, yeah. <clears throat> on the yeah. front end of the burr. <laughs> And real quick on rates, again, A, you're going to be probably somewhere in that four and a half mark. B, you're going to be five and a half to six. And C, private, you're going to be probably eight and a half, eight, nine, nine, eight, seven, nine, in and around that range. Yeah. Very cool. Right on. Any questions, guys? Any further questions? Chime in. Now's your chance. Last chance. <clears throat> Get in there. If you got anything you want to ask, um, Ryan or the team, fire away. Ryan, I, I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. um so i guess it's like a two-part question uh part number one so let's say if somebody was looking at an investment property and they were thinking about putting it under a corporation as opposed to their personal name uh, how does that change the lending from your perspective good question as well so that is really um lender dependent not every lender will allow you to do that so right now as off the top of my head i'm going to say 20 percent of the lenders do that Okay, so that's realistically lender but like first national example great lender on the A side and the B side, they don't allow for it, mm -hmm. right, they don't allow for it at all. Um, Meaning if they see a corporation they're just like no. Correct. Yeah. And then the other myth too is just because it's in a, in a corporation doesn't give you like an invisible path or a shield to automatically qualify for it, you still have to qualify for it, just as if it wasn't in the court. Right. So what, what we're, what we're doing on the corporate side, uh, you know, with our, our, our tax structure, we, you know, we have multiple corporations. Uh, personally, I have multiple, we have multiple corporations and we make money in those corporations. And the reason we set those things up was to save tax, uh, save on the tax side, you know, all, all above board, all the, you know, tax strategy planning. And then when it comes time to qualify for mortgages, it's like, uh, you're going to need to show some more income here, Cam, personally. Uh, these are the kind of the messages I'm getting. And, uh, and so what happens is then, you know, you've got to throw some money over at yourself personally, if you're going to be qualifying for, from, you got to throw some money over to yourself from those corporations, you know, bump up the numbers, increase the amount that you're actually paying personally, maybe being paid personally, I should say. And then it kind of screws up your tax planning a little bit, but it's kind of a, it, you have to balance it out, right? Like, what, do you want to buy some property? Um, or do you just want to save on taxes? Right. And so you know, it's, it's unfortunately not so, um, cut and dry. Um, but I, I'm still a fan of corporation structures. Me too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so the second part to that would be, so if you did decide to go with the corp, um, and you're looking at, let's say a four unit, maybe a five unit, are you able to do that on the residential side or that's going to go under for commercial? So Another good one. Yeah. We basically on the broker channel stop at four units, anything above five, six, seven units, 
that does slide you more into the commercial space, which, which we as brokers really don't, uh, don't dabble. Any commercial stuff that we do is pretty much private. It's just not really in our, in our wheelhouse. We focus, like I said, four units or four units or less. Gotcha. Right. Radio. Um, okay. Guys, last chance, final, final call. We're going to sign off here. It's been a great show. It's been awesome to have you, Ryan. Thank you. Um, and thanks, thanks so much for the questions. As always, it's wonderful to have you all joining us every week. For the new people who've joined us and the regulars, we love <clears> you. <throat> thanks for coming in. The show's great because of you guys. It's a great community. We're trying to keep the the you know really engagement. Um, give you guys as much value as we can. All that we would ask in return is that you share um, maybe our YouTube channel or our resources with people who are thinking about buying or selling real estate. That would be that's our only ask. Um, and really, that's that's really it for the week. Anything else to add, guys? Uh, I see a question here from Robin. I believe oh, this one. Okay. Uh, lenders allowing borrowing from HELOC for down payment uh, for a rental property. Absolutely, they do. But the catch with that is now we have to count in something to service that debt. So if you borrowed say fifty thousand dollars from a line of credit, that's great. But now I have to add that liability for you to service that loan which may pull out the ratios. But yeah, absolutely, you can borrow from line of credit. Lots of people do it. We just have to be conscious that it's not going to um, stop you from qualifying for the deal because of that extra component, right? That extra payment. Yeah, line of credits are beautiful tools awesome. for investing. Absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. I love them. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. Anything else to add? I think that's it. I think we're going to wrap it up. Once again, uh, I'm just going to share Ryan's uh, contact info. Sorry, I should have done that earlier. For those of you wanting to connect with Ryan, here is uh, his information. Ryan Kish, mortgages at ryankish.ca. You can go to his website there. You got his phone number. Um, we will uh, always be able to give that to you if you wanted to reach out to us and get his information. Happy to share that with you. You can reach Ryan there. And uh, thanks again, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. And uh, we'll see you back in a few weeks. Amazing. Got it. Yeah, indeed. We'll have you back again to do an update. I think we'll do this on maybe a monthly basis. Let's do that. We should, we should also touch base as well, possibly after the 7th. We'll see what that rate hike looks like. And yeah, anyone, anyone feel like September anyone, 7th. Sorry. We should put a little wager together. What do you guys think? What do you think? Do you think quarter point? You think in half point? I think people are talking 0.75 out there. I quarter think that you if you think quarter point. Quarter point. That's Adam's my bet. Going, yeah, Adam's I going. Half. Yeah. Fast and furious. You're going half, Ryan. I'm going half. Yeah. Yeah. A little, uh, little bearish. Don't get me wrong, though. It could be not at all. These these. I think what they're doing is working. And I think it's working faster or as good as they want it to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if we have someone that just said 7.75. Yeah. Gary, Gary's going in for 0.75. Hmm. So those I'll let you know after the 16th. Pardon me? Sorry. Wow. I said, I'll, I'll make my prediction after the 16th. After it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really work like that, buddy. Uh, how about a Twinkie or maybe not a Twinkie? How about some kind of bet? Like whoever, whoever, whoever wins. I don't know. I should have some sort of bet. we got lots of predictions coming in here. Pat, I think 50. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with 50 points, you know, I'm yeah. going to go with point. I'm going to go with half a point. I don't think we're going to see that monster 1% again. <laughs> that was a real big shock. Okay. The, probably the largest in, in 25, 26 years, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I mean, the media and the government, what they say they do and, and what they do are two different things. But from what I understood and what the general consensus was that they were going to really front load that and make a big one as opposed to just doing a bunch of small ones at, you know, quarter, half, quarter, half, 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 mm -hmm. and kind of supersized and front loaded that for one full percentage point back on July 14th. Right. Right on. Um, yeah. So I'm a half a point here. What did you say around quarter? I'm going to go with half a point. You're going half point. Yeah. Adam's going and quarter. Then, and then I feel like October could be zero, right? I think October could be flat. In December, those are the three dates there, guys. In the uh, in the chat there. Yeah, September seventh, October twenty seventh, December seventh, are the rate hikes. Aro, you're going what? You don't know. You're not putting anything together. Look at together. the inflation data first, but I'm. I think it's going to be probably 0.5. So you're going to hold off, right? Is what you're saying. You're waiting. 
I'll wait to see. Pretty sure it's going to be 25, though. Yeah. Guys. All right. Well, we'll see what, how it goes. We'll keep an eye on it. As Maybe always, it'll be zero. Maybe it'll be zero. It could be zero. It, it totally could be zero. Imagine they dropped it. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> Something will have to be broken severely between now and then in the economy or in the world. And, and hey, it could happen. You never know. Mm -hmm. um, okay, as always, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you again. Always um, a pleasure. And uh, until next week. Oh, wait, there's a question. Sorry, there's Should a question. On it? Yeah. <laughs> I just saw it. Oh, my God. Last Thank question. No, here we go. Randy, go. Oh, if you own seven properties, all rented out and have 250K income, can you mortgage? another property the game answer, right? how does it depends i mean i need i need to know way more information right um what are the mortgage balances on those properties what are they renting for is that 250 from um is that 250 from you know salary or, or work or is that part of the rental so no mortgage on any of them seven properties all paid off and no mortgage yep slam dunk easy not a problem yeah, there's no other debt on there. All those properties are going to be cash flowing. Not a problem at all. So they'll just take the expenses into consideration, I suppose. Yeah, eh? the, the, the minimal expenses, but the rents should easily offset all of that. Even if those places were renting out for, for $1,500 or $2,000 for the whole homes, they would still have no negative impact on that eighth property. Throw a bunch of mortgages on there. Absolutely, they're going to impact. And doing the eighth one could be very very challenging right yeah the financing costs are by far the most expensive portion generally speaking depending on the size of the mortgage right yo okay Maybe now we're gone send randy ryan's info so they can connect sure yeah let's uh sorry what was that are you gonna send it over or you want i was gonna say maybe we should send randy ryan's info so that they can connect it was up yeah, there on the screen there yeah let's see here yeah. there you go Perfect. All right, guys, we're going to head out. Um, thanks again. And until next week, happy investing. <laughs>